Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. And in this video, I have made probably the greatest milestone I have ever made in my life. And that is this month, June 2020, I am projected to save 80% of my income. Now, I'm pretty sure I made a video sometime last year. I'll put that screenshot there of me saving 60% of my income. So I've never saved 80% of my income and I don't know why. Like this month of June, post COVID-19, I've just been really obsessed with saving as much money as possible. So the first part of the video, I'll go through what I've done to be able to save 80%. And then also later on, I'll tell you guys exactly why I'm so obsessed with saving so much money so I can get into investing into the market. So if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Okay guys, so before we get started, just a quick background of, of my current situation, right? Because a lot of you guys watching this might have different scenarios. Um, so I am single, I don't have any kids, and I also live with family. So a lot of people, they may have kids and you guys might have a wife or girlfriend. So it's gonna be a lot different for you guys. But for me, the reason why I believe I was able to save so much money is because of my current scenario right now. So the big three expenses that people in the fire community know about is rent, transportation, and food. So rent, I was able to cut off, but I do contribute $200 a month to my family in, in terms of rent and food. But yeah, in terms of rent, essentially I was able to cut that off, which is one of the biggest expenses you can ever have. And also for transportation, the fact that I'm working from home, post COVID-19, I was able to cut that out significantly. Um, and finally for food, I've spent a lot of my gift cards um, just so I can do this challenge for you guys. Cause I told myself that I wanted to do a YouTube challenge where I can save 80% of my income and all right, So with all of that said, um, let's dive into my budget. All right guys, so obviously by the time of me shooting this video, it's currently the 11th of June. So I still have 20 days left to go of the month before I complete this challenge. So, but I've obviously prepaid a lot of my expenses. So I've prepaid my internet, my cell phone, um, my car insurance. I've prepaid all of that just so I can get a handle of where I'm gonna end up with this challenge so I can forecast my budget. So I've already prepaid all of my fixed expenses. So we'll start off with that and then I'm gonna project or I'm gonna budget with you guys how much I can foresee myself spending in the next 20 days so I can meet that 80% challenge. And I went pretty aggressive with this budget because, you know, who knows what, what, you know, what I might need between now and the end of June. So let's start off with utilities. So utilities, um, for me, that, that just includes phone and internet. Everything else, again, I stay with family, so that should be taken care of. So for me, utilities, I spent a total of $114.67 for utilities. All right, so car insurance, again, I prepaid this. Now, I prepaid a total of $368. I use a 0% APR credit card the Chase Freedom card, which gives me 0% APR from now until the end of May of 2021 next year. So I just went ahead and prepaid that because I'm not, um, obviously not a big deal if it's a 0% APR card. And again, if you guys are interested, I'll leave that affiliate link for that card below. Again, I'm not sponsored by Chase, obviously, but any help to the channel will be greatly, greatly appreciated. So if you take that $368 that I prepaid, that's a six month car insurance. So divide that by six, that is a total of $61.33 for car insurance. Now we have miscellaneous. So, so far in the 11 days of June, I've spent $21.60 in miscellaneous things that I buy from Walmart. Um, so I spent $21.60 on that. Food for me is mainly buying things from outside, so eating out. Again, I live with family, so um, my $200 contribution serves food mainly, but sometimes I get tired of um, eating at the house. So I spent so far $34.61 just getting food from, from out and about. Um, again, the reason why I was able to keep my food budget so low so far in the first 11 days because I've, I've been spending a lot of gift cards. So all the gift cards that I've received from Christmas and also I'm liquidating some points of mine for my credit cards. I know that's probably a cardinal sin in the points and miles games, but for me, I just want to complete this challenge so bad. And I'll tell you why later in this video why I'm so obsessed with saving and investing so much in the month of June and especially in 2020. But anyway, so for food so far in 11 days, I've spent $31 and 61 cents. Um, now car payment. Now I've probably had the biggest regret of my life back then is, um, you know, me and my family, we decided to buy a Toyota Corolla that's brand new. Again, 
probably the biggest regret of my life, buying a brand new car. You know, I always preach in my channel, graduating from college, never buy a brand new car. It's probably the worst decision you can ever make, you know. But, um, uh, so this car payment, I'm actually splitting with my brother. My brother currently has that car. He's using that. So he's paying half and I'm paying half. I'm obviously, I'm driving my old college car, but he's the one that's driving the brand new car. Um, but yeah, I'm helping him with the payments on that. So for me, my part of that payment is 135 um, okay, so rent. Again, like I told you guys earlier in the video, my rent is $200, which I contribute to the family. All right, so the next three are projected expenses, right? And these are very aggressive projections. Um, obviously, I went very aggressive just because I want to be able to budget really well and make sure I meet the budget instead of blowing it. Okay, so the first projection is gas. Obviously, by the time of sh me shooting this video, I still have three more weekends in June, and I do plan to drive uh, four hours to Dallas, Texas to, to visit some family. So just that fact alone, and then who knows what I'm gonna do the next two weekends. Um, I'm just gonna aggressively estimate $120 for gas. That's a very aggressive estimate for gas. Um, so miscellaneous, who knows what kind of expenses I'm gonna make between now and the end of June. So I have about 20 more days until the end of June. So I'm gonna say $100 in miscellaneous expenses, toiletries, whatever I might need. So $100 for that. And then for food, which is mainly eating out. So maybe I get tired of the gift cards that I'm spending and I wanna try some local mom and pop shops here and there. Uh, I'm gonna say $100. Again, most of the time during the weekdays I eat at home anyway. So I'm just gonna say $100 for eating out. So that puts us again, guys, for a total projected expenses of $887.21 with which that right there guys is roughly 20% of my income that I've spent. So the remaining 80% that money I plan to use via investing. Now all of that I probably will just keep in cash. Um, again as many of you guys know I'm actually very obsessed with accumulating cash especially with the potential projection of the stock market in Q4 2020, potentially testing new lows. So yeah, I think I think the stock market has a good shot of potentially testing new lows in Q4 of 2020. So that's why I'm accumulating as much cash as possible. But obviously I, I don't wanna accumulate, accumulate too much cash. I wanna make sure I have an uh, investing place that I'm doing currently at the moment. So yes, so with all of that said, that is my budget. Now let's move on to why I'm so obsessed but, Specifically in 2020, why I'm so obsessed with saving and investing my money, right, guys? So, and that is actually because of Bitcoin. So, so many of you guys that have been following me, you guys have seen that I got into the market, the Bitcoin space in 2017. Obviously, in 2017, I've made so much money, but all that money was unrealized gains. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, I had a six-figure portfolio. I I had like a uh, I believe 160 grand, somewhere around there. I had a 160 grand portfolio and it, and it just crashed and burned down, right? Obviously, it's not a loss because I still hold the same portfolio to this day. Um, so yeah, I could have realized the gains, but um, yeah, I, I definitely regret that so hard. But I learned a lot from, from that. I learned a lot about Bitcoin. I did, I did very, very fundamental research on Bitcoin itself. And because of that, my conviction into Bitcoin has just grown significantly exponentially so um, yeah let's let's move on to actually why um, I, I I'm just obsessed with the Bitcoin asset class right guys so as many of you guys know right now today our Federal Reserve here in the United States is printing a lot of money um, you know and a lot of people actually uh, would say that yeah printing a lot of money it's gonna cost cost a lot of inflation yeah that's true maybe later on so again I don't want to nerd out too much in this video, but yeah, so inflation actually equals money supply times uh, velocity of money. So I'll, I'll explain both, right? So obviously money supply is just like how much money is in the system. So yeah, obviously as the Fed prints money, money supply will increase, right? But velocity is actually how much money is circulating. So let's say I have a dollar and I tip the waiter that dollar, that waiter tips another waiter a dollar and that waiter tips another waiter a dollar, right? So basically, how much how much of the money is circulating in our current system right now? So obviously right now, post COVID-19, money supply exponentially increased because of the Federal Reserve printing a lot of money, but also velocity of money decreased significantly, guys. So that's why you're seeing inflation rates actually lower than the 2% mark. I believe uh, pre-COVID-19 inflation was at 2%. 
currently right now inflation is actually lower than 2%. So yeah, for any of you guys think that the Fed printing all this money is actually gonna cause inflation, yes, you are right, but not right now, definitely in the future. Because right now people like me, um, a lot of people honestly, they're just hoarding cash. Hoarding cash in their mattress and just like, we're very unsure right now of what's gonna happen in the end of 2020, 2021. And because of that fact, inflation won't come at the moment, right guys? But anyway, so once inflation comes, that might be in 2021, 2022, I don't know. Basically, inflation is gonna come when people start to build confidence again in the market. So when people feel like it's good to spend money on TVs again, um, inflation is gonna come you know, in all sorts of places. It's All the cash will liquidate into real estate, into stocks, into Bitcoin, into gold. So yes, I am basically waiting for that to happen. I don't know when it's gonna happen exactly. Uh, might be, I'm not saying hyperinflation, I'm just saying a very healthy dose of inflation um, where all the cash that people have been hoarding under their mattress and their bank accounts, it's all gonna flood towards asset classes. It's a lot of cash, guys, it's a lot of cash. Once that happens, every asset class you can think of is gonna appreciate it in value. But anyway, let's actually talk specifically about Bitcoin, which is my favorite asset class. So obviously Bitcoin was created by Satoshi Nakamoto and no one knows exactly who he is. He basically wrote a code that's an open source code and back in 2009. So he basically wrote a code and gave it to a bunch of programmers. And yeah, the fact that it's open source, a bunch of computer, uh, computer people, computer nerds, they basically, you know, you can just write the code, write the Bitcoin code and make sure it just keeps running. So right now we, we haven't actually seen Satoshi Nakamoto and to be honest with you guys, it doesn't really matter. It actually helps the image of Bitcoin not having a creator. If you think about Facebook, right? So Facebook, you have Mark Zuckerberg, Tesla, you have Elon Musk. Now imagine if Zuckerberg or Elon Musk got assassinated, right guys? So the, the stock will plunge, right? But here in Bitcoin, there's no CEO in quotes, right? There's no like, you know, you can't just assassinate the CEO and the Bitcoin price crashes. The, now, Bitcoin price crashes because of like certain economic factors, not because, you know, the CEO got killed. So yeah, anyway, the fact that Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin is not known, the fact that it's so decentralized and open source, you know, that's the reason why I strongly believe in the Bitcoin white paper and the Bitcoin protocol. Now, there's actually a few charts that I wanna show you guys. Um, the first chart is actually these bubble charts. Now these bubble charts is actually explained. Now this chart was actually created in June of 2017. So now it's 2020, so the chart's a bit outdated. But it just shows you the comparison of um, an asset class like Bitcoin compared to many other asset classes and even billionaires. So if, if you look at Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, um, well back then it was 41 billion, but now Bitcoin is hovering around, I believe 170 billion, um, more or less. So you have billionaires that, that are worth more than Bitcoin. You know, you have Amazon, which is now a trillion dollar market cap. Apple is a trillion dollar market cap now. Um, and these are US companies, right? So Bitcoin is actually a global phenomenon, right? Not just in the US, but you know, Apple and Amazon, a US company was able to achieve a trillion market cap, you know, just being a US company. Um, obviously the gold market cap is a trillion now compared to Bitcoin. Now the narrative is actually for Bitcoin to be the gold standard. So if you have a gold standard at an 8 trillion market cap, you know, and Bitcoin currently at 200 billion, you know, just for us to achieve that narrative of being the digital gold, the gold standard, right? We would at least need a 2 trillion market cap. So that's basically a 10X from here. You know, 200 billion roughly times 10, that's 2 trillion. So for us to be, you know, considered, for us, for the narrative of digital gold of Bitcoin to even to even continue to be talked about for the next five years, you know, we would have to reach that two trillion dollar market cap, which is a fraction of gold, knowing that gold is eight trillion. So yeah, and then you have basically physical money, stocks, and and, and all of money. So just a, just a different chart to show you guys this. So as you see here at the top left of the screen, uh, the total cryptocurrency market cap is a very very tiny piece compared to all of the asset classes in the world, like real estate bonds, commodities, stocks, a very, very tiny piece. And if you think about it, I believe that cryptocurrency blockchain is the next revolution after the internet. You know, back then there was so much hype of having, you know, being able to surf the web like uh, Google and AOL back, to, back in the day in, in the year 2000. So back then the internet hype was real, right? And that was only in the US. And again, I remind you guys, 
cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is a global phenomenon, you know, and the fact that this revolutionizing technology is just a tiny piece of the total asset of the world, you know, just for us to, let's say, imagine if you were a hedge fund manager and let's just say you put, let's say every hedge fund manager allocates 1%, 1% of their portfolio in the cryptocurrency market space, right? Now, just think about that. Like, I believe the cryptocurrency market space can achieve 10 trillion if every hedge fund manager out there, every institutional investor allocates just 1% of their portfolio into the cryptocurrency market space. I think 10 trillion is a very conservative number for the total cryptocurrency market cap. All right, so final price, um, final chart actually that I wanna show you guys and is actually why I'm so obsessed specifically with saving so much money and then reinvesting that into Bitcoin is this halving chart, right? So obviously you guys know, um, for any of you guys that have been keeping paying attention to the cryptocurrency market. The cryptocurrency market has achieved, um, Bitcoin specifically, I'm talking about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has achieved three halving so far now. So one in 2012, one in 2016, and just a few months ago, actually a month ago in May of 2020. So three halving so far. So what is the halving? So the halving is basically when the new supply of Bitcoin gets cut in half, right guys? So imagine this, right? Just, just imagine a scenario where, you know, you have, 10 people in the village and those 10 people are basically fighting over bananas and let's say there's 10 bananas so obviously 10 people 10 bananas will just price banana at one right now imagine if me as like this control freak right i basically control the bananas the banana supply the the new banana supply where the next day instead of producing 10 bananas a day to, to feed one banana per person. Now I just produce, since I'm the producer, I produce five bananas. Now imagine 10 people, the same 10 people, I, you know, I didn't increase the demand, just the same demand, 10 people fighting over five bananas, you know? So for me as a producer, I can basically increase the price, you know? Because like, it's the same demand. 10 people are demanding 10 bananas, but there's only five. So what am I gonna, what am I gonna do as a producer? I'm gonna increase the price of the bananas. So yeah, essentially that is why I believe in Bitcoin so much is because every four years, the Bitcoin supply gets cut in half. So yes, in the short term, it always happens. You know, if you look at the last two halvings in the short term, the Bitcoin price slowly dips a little bit after the Bitcoin halving, but one year, two years down the road, it always recovers and makes all time new highs, right? So let's, let's actually look at this chart guys. So the first halving actually occurred on November of 2012. Now, on that date, November 2012, the price of Bitcoin was $12.31. Man, I wish I could buy Bitcoin back then. Um, I was in college back in the day. Would have loved to buy Bitcoin at that price. I'd be a millionaire by now. But anyway, so the price of Bitcoin, November 2012, was $12.31. Now, it took one year. It took one year and the price increased by 8,000% went from $12.31 to almost $1,000, right? And after that, what happened? Crash, right? That's the Bitcoin cycle, guys. So we, we hyper moon and we crash. That's just the nature of Bitcoin. Now let's move on to the next cycle. The next cycle happened in July of 2016. July of 2016, the price of Bitcoin was at $650. What, what do we do? We went all the way up to $20,000. Actually, this cycle is when I got into Bitcoin, but towards the end of it. So I actually got into Bitcoin when it was around $8,000 or maybe less, 7,000, right around 2017. Went all the way up to $20,000 and then here we are now, we've crashed all the way to 3,000 right around December of 2018. Obviously, we did it again in COVID, but not for long. We basically crashed at 3,800, but recovered significantly post-COVID. So where are we now? So right now, we just finished the May of 2020 having again, another supply cut of Bitcoin. So May 2020, um, I don't really know what the exact price of Bitcoin at the May 2020 having is, but just may, sometime, uh, some, somewhere between 9,500, you know, and, and 10,000. So just, just to be conservative, I'm just gonna say $10,000 was the price of Bitcoin in the May 2020 having, right guys? So if you look at the first having, the price increased by 8,000% after the first having. The second having the price increased by roughly 3,000%. Now, let's just say conservatively, the price increases by 1,000%, right? During this next market cycle. So just taking that logic alone, at that 1,000% increase is basically a 10X in current price. So the current price of Bitcoin now today is $10,000. So a 1,000% increase would be $100,000. 
So again, that's very conservative, right? Because like, you know, nowadays it's so different. You know, you, you have the Federal Reserve printing so much money, um, the reallocation of portfolio. So that's a very conservative estimate, $100,000. Now let's look at the time period. The first Bitcoin halving, it took Bitcoin around 369 days, so about one year to hit its peak. The next Bitcoin halving in 2016, it took Bitcoin 526 days, which is roughly about 1.5 years, right? Now let's just say very, very conservatively that it's gonna take three years from the 2020 halving for Bitcoin to peak. So that puts us to about May of 2023. At the very latest, again, these are very conservative predictions. So I believe that by May of 2023, we can see a Bitcoin price of $100,000. So, you know, that's why I'm so obsessed with, with getting into Bitcoin right now because of the potential upside. You know, right now I am 27 years old and you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, um, this thing hits zero and, and I lose 100% of my capital. You know, so what? You know, I'm already used to actually living um, a very happy and frugal life, a very minimalist life. So yeah, if it's, yeah, if it doesn't work out and this thing goes to zero, you know, so be it. I'll probably work for another decade of my life. I do plan to retire once Bitcoin hits peak in 2023. So yeah, I guess my biggest risk is that I add another decade of working, which is actually a big risk, but in terms of financial risk, whatever. Um, it's just like the risk of 100% of my capital versus the potential upside of 1000%. For me, it's just a no brainer, you know? I'm definitely willing to risk 100% of my capital for this 1000% gain. It's just, for me, it's a no brainer. For someone that's 27 years old, Time is on my side, guys. I'm 27 years old. You know, I have uh, decades, decades of investing left in me. You know, I may never become a multi-billionaire, you know, but all, all I really need is just enough to uh, do my passion, YouTube and traveling and things like that. So as long as I just achieve the minimum income threshold to do these kind of things, I'll be happy, you know. I don't really need to become a billionaire. I just need enough money to be able to have leverage to do the things that I like. But anyway, thank you guys for watching this video. Um, I appreciate it. I definitely appreciate it if you give me a thumbs up and comment down on my video below. Uh, just tell me, you know, the things that you've enjoyed about this video and tell me the things that you want me to pursue in my next videos. Like what topics do you want me to talk about? Again, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe and I will see you guys at the, ne at the next video. Also, follow me on my Instagram. Instagram is Project Influencers. There I post more casual pictures. So follow me there and I'll see you guys at the next video. All right.